Hi, I'm Jackson Bird, and today I am joined by registered nurse Sheena Williams and Dr. Alok Patel from PBS <laughs> Vitals. And today we're going to be discussing what trans people wish healthcare professionals knew. So we went to social media and we asked all of you, trans and non binary and gender non conforming people specifically, what you wish that healthcare professionals knew, and also asked some questions that they have for the two of you. So we're going to start with a QA, but then very quickly go to what I've been calling an A and A. We're just going to like answer and answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is what what uh, all of you out there watching said you wish they knew and so we're just going to kind of hear your take on it and like what you think uh based on yeah what people had to say lay it down shred us if you need to <laughs> <laughs> we're ready all right so we'll start simple with the q a uh so one of the first questions i got which i thought was really good uh because i've wondered about this too myself is what, if any, training about trans, non-binary, or gender non-conforming people was presented in your original education or training? And are there ways you think med schools could do better? None. Zero. Zilch. Wow. Just nothing. Nothing. The only time that I feel like I was educated is when I worked for a hospital that did gender uh, transformation surgeries. So then I was educated, but the education was still very minimal. The education was basically what orders I needed to follow in order to take care of that patient medically. And it was a little bit of mental health and psych, and psych in there, but definitely not enough to support the mental health of someone after such a dynamic surgery. So definitely zero, zilch. None. Wow, that is so disappointing. To it's not even, it's yeah. not even talked about in, med, in nursing school. It's not talked about in nursing school. It is not talked about in, in it's just not a thing. And how long ago did you go to, just in case we can be optimistic that yeah, maybe it's Yeah, I have been a nurse for 10 years. I'm a nurse in Philly. All right. So maybe, but... <laughs> I'm trying to been told y'all, they don't be educating us on that. And you know, I'm not saying that it doesn't need to be. I'm oh, just oh saying no, yeah, that yeah, yeah. It's something that is just not, they, they do not prioritize us learning that information. And you probably would learn it specifically for the floor that you're on, if that's something that goes, like, you know, if that's something that is prioritized there. A little quote about you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invert this, and I'll start with the good news first. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to optimism first. Like, so nowadays, I will say, you know, so I'm a, a, a pediatric hospitalist, so a pediatrician who works in a hospital. I take care of kids aged premature baby up until, like, early 20s at Stanford University. And we have a lot more lectures now. It's like grand rounds of specialty lectures, even resident talks about caring for transgender individuals, people who are non-gender conforming. We, we talk a lot more about it now, including different modalities of treatment, how to seek help, how to communicate with these patients, which is great. We hear from patient advocates, all of it. This is now. Now, if we rewind, when I was in medical school, I'm also in the camp of Sheena, we're saying we learned like zilch about this. Wow. And you know, in medical school, you learn about biology and anatomy and physiology and pathology. So we learn all about the endocrine system and the reproductive system, anatomy, chromosomes, all the stuff that we talk about when we use these specific terms like biology. But you don't learn a lot about downstream and you know what happens if an individual has a gender that does not identify with what they were assigned as, as birth. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that's happening nowadays. And I, it's my guess is I hope, I hope, I pray that medical education is changing in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Because a lot of more socially conscious topics related to public health were not discussed back in the day in medical school. Yeah. And like, I'm hoping that's a shift now. I mean, shoot, if there's any medical students watching your channel, watching this right now, I hope they chime in in the comments. And just for knowledge, medical, anything takes a long time to change. Mm. Even for evidence-based practice, it still takes a long time to change things on a larger scale. So it's definitely something that I think with more research and more education that we're hoping will definitely change. Yeah, and this leads me into an answer and answer, but I will save it because I got one more question okay. for you for the Q&A <laughs> portion. Uh, you're jumping ahead. This is great. I love it, though. So here's a question. Someone said, how hard would it be to add a chosen name and pronoun section to your record keeping system if you don't already do it? And like, how difficult is it to update after someone's had a legal name change? So in those sort of systems, is it is that an easy thing? Is it e also I will add to this to the extent that that exists in some practices. Is that information that like everyone who works there can see? Do they know what to do with that information? Yes, so I work for um, a medical system that uses Epic, and Epic is a like computer health system, and they do 
um, have on your admission when you first come in the hospital they ask you your pronouns and how would you like to be preferred so they ask you for your pronouns but they also ask you if you have a preferred name mm -hmm. so like, like if it's different from what's on your health insurance yeah, or, yeah because some people prefer their nickname some people prefer a certain name that aren't is totally different from their name yeah and like not even related to mm -hmm. being trans exactly right. yeah, it's just yeah. it's just it's just you know randomly they just want to be called a certain name and they identify with that name you know people like that they are have a yeah. random nickname that yeah. you know them by but it's not their real name so yeah. we do have that but again that's in a certain system in certain situations in certain states so I don't know if everyone does that but I have seen that but as far as changing it that's just um, an admissions conversation like if you wanted to change it you would just call down to the admissions department and change it's not that's not hard to change yeah and I'll, I'll say for just from a quick uh, like trans perspective of someone who has legally changed his name and gender updating it in the system I mean, like any admin thing, it was a little bit tough and yeah. like didn't like work right away. So sometimes that's like a few extra phone calls you got to make. Yeah. yeah. In our hospital system, it is pretty easy to change a name, add a preferred name, a nickname, whatever you want mm -hmm. to not only Epic to include that, but also on what we call our sign out. So basically every time I come into the hospital and I get my huge list of patients, we have what we call as a sign out. So it's almost like a, a summary of every single patient and I will have their the patient's name and pronouns, preferred name. And we talk about it in sign out. So we will say, this is a 16 year old patient, name is so-and-so, pronouns, whatever, when it's applicable. So that is there. The one thing that I wanted to address though is, you know, I've had some teenage patients ask me like, why is my birth name on this at all? Like, mm -hmm. I just want my preferred name. The reason that's on there in some cases is because we want to be able to access medical records from in the mm -hmm. past. Mm -hmm. That is all it's for. It is not because in these hospital systems, we're trying to deny that. I can't speak for every hospital system because I know there's some states out there where, you know, the healthcare industry might be pushing against trans care, but at least from what I represent, we are very respectful and inclusive to try to include name changes. I mean, that's definitely good to hear that it's happening in some places for sure, because definitely not everywhere, like you said. Um, well, so, okay, we're kind of already getting into a big theme from the answers that I got from people. So moving on to the ANA section. Overwhelmingly, the biggest response that I got when I asked trans and non-binary people, what do you wish healthcare professionals knew, was that basically, we are still trans when we are accessing care that has nothing to do with being trans. And people have a lot of really negative experiences going to the doctor for, I don't know, like the flu or, or a broken bone or something, or not going uh, to different like places, you know, not going to a dermatologist or something like that because they're scared about how they're gonna be treated. So for example, here's what uh, one person said, trans care is more than hormones and surgery. It's also about making us comfortable during regular visits. And so I think, you know, what we were just saying about those intake forms, like if that's something where everyone who works there, like the front desk, desk staff knows to follow those forms, like that's one small step. I also think it's just about like some humans are just better humans than other humans. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm not Getting trying, to be, I'm not yeah, trying no. to be funny, but like when I have a Muslim patient, I'm very careful about how I treat them. I'm very careful about making sure that when it's their prayer time that, I'm, that I don't knock on their door. I'm very careful about like, I know you need a basin, you're gonna have to uncover I don't need to see your hair, girlfriend. So let me know when you're ready for your medication. I feel like that's a part of my job is to support people in their stuff mm -hmm. and whatever stuff they have, their good stuff, their bad stuff, all of their stuff is not my business. I don't have to understand it. All I have to do is support it. So let, baby girl, what do you need? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like, you know, I under I totally understand that like, oh, when I come into the doctor's office, I want to be treated like a person and not necessarily, you know, looked at a certain type of way. But I think that that's just sometimes humans not understanding. But even in times where I had no idea what trans even meant or knew anybody that was trans, I still minded my business. And in times when I had patients that that told me that they were trans, I respected their wishes. So before you know, what you do need to know, you can also still just be respectful and then ask questions when you need to. Yeah, oh, I love that. Like, I think so much about this is compassion towards other humans, but also a little bit of that cultural sensitivity training. Like the example you gave about like prayer time with some of your Muslim patients, like you had to like learn that at some point or, or, or know other Muslim people to know that. And right. so I think that's part of the thing that's a frustration with trans people too, is that a lot of like healthcare professionals just don't know some mm -hmm. of the accommodations that we might need. I 100% echo what Sheena was saying about cultural competency and respect. I also think it's important if we explain why we are asking certain questions. Ah, yes. Right. So it's like, we ask questions. I mean, I ask my teen patients about like drug use, 
amount of sexual partners, do you use protection, all this stuff. And like, I can't just come out there and be like, yo man, do you get laid? Like you have to be respectful and say, here is why I'm asking this question. Here is why I'm kicking your parent out of this room. Like this is the safe space we're creating. And patients are actually like, I think sometimes patients get a bad rap. People in the hospital and they think like, oh, if you mess up with this patient, they're gonna yell at you and close you off. But if you if you honestly know what you don't know, mm -hmm. and you can claim to be, you can say I'm ignorant about this, but I'm trying to understand and ask you these questions. Like people open up, and I'll give you a very, I'll give you an example about why it's important for us to understand how to communicate with trans patients. Is I recently was taking care of a teenage individual, and um, this individual came in the hospital in the emergency department for abdominal pain. Now, my protocol in my mind, if you have acute severe abdominal pain, is a little bit different depending on your gender. And so in that situation, it was important to come in there and, you know, regardless of my wording, just be honest about it. Be like, listen, what do you identify as? What, what sex were you assigned at birth? Because this actually does change if I'm worried about something like ovarian torsion or pregnancy versus something that could be wrong with your testicles. Right. Well, she was completely open about it. I was going to say, and, and another follow-up with that, too, in that particular case where it is relevant is also, like, you know, what have you done with medical transition? Because I think sometimes exactly. there's also an assumption of, like, oh, this, like, you know, this trans guy who's assigned female at birth has X, Y, Z, but, like, if you've been on hormones for a while or had cer certain surgical mm -hmm. interventions, mm -hmm. then it's different again. So, yeah, there are times where it's relevant, but I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because there were a few people who were saying, like, sometimes they feel like healthcare professionals are too eager to, like, talk and ask questions about things that maybe are not relevant and feel kind of private. Or, like, where, where are the times when, like, you don't need to know? Like, does the dentist need to know your trans background or like here I've been getting COVID tests around the city and the form we have to fill out for a free COVID test has like birth sex on it and frankly I've just lied because I was like I'm about to have this interaction with this person I don't know if I feel safe right now and I don't think this is relevant and if I find out it is later then whatever I'll have a conversation but like yeah I did like but sometimes it is though yeah. Like, you know, when you go to the dentist, the sex that you are assigned at birth matters because women have issues with vitamin D and all like and all of those things with their teeth for different reasons. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So so I feel you because a COVID test, I don't know. Like, but I do think or something, yeah. I mean, but I do yeah. think that like there are some cases that like I wouldn't even know and I'm a medical professional myself, but I there's some things that and don't get me wrong, there's plenty there's questions that I'm asked too that I'm uncomfortable because I, sure. I can't imagine it being on, you know, your end and in a whole in and in for someone that doesn't understand you so I totally agree I think that there's definitely moments that we probably don't have to ask those questions but if you're not a medical professional you don't know because I right. don't even know what diseases or ailments could be from male to female yeah and, it, and it, again that's that's another time of like is this person on hormone replacement therapy as well mm -hmm. because a lot of stuff with like teeth and bones like changes because some stuff that we think of as like this happens to men this happens to women some of it is because of chromosomes some of sure. it is because of hormones and hormones. so when you've been on hormones for a while that that changes and so like needing to know those different things and that's so, well, all i'm saying is like i feel like the dentist the dermatologist whoever should just explain here's why, why they need to know right. yeah like right, here's right, here's yeah. why it's important for me to know because otherwise it's like i'm just eager like you got to build the trust first right yeah That's imagine asking people their code status when we ask people about like whether they want to be full code and things like that they freak out what like, does that mean it means whether or not they want full cpr full resuscitation in case something happens to them and we have to ask people these questions and they feel like am i dying oh, hold on you're asking know, me what screening. happens you yeah. know but no it's a screening so i explain to people first like this is just a screening it doesn't mean that anything's wrong we ask them are they comfortable with blood we ask them all the types of questions and it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with their personal care right now it's hypothetical questions that we may need to know. Well, so here's a good question because I feel like, uh, you know, we're getting a little into like this, like patients versus uh, medical professionals thing. So one thing is someone had a really great reminder uh, of just saying, not all the trans people in that situation are the patients. Some of your colleagues might be trans too. Absolutely. And I just love that, you know, more and more trans people entering the healthcare profession. Yep. And I, I hope we have a environment where they're open talk, to talk about it and be an advocate and a health professional who can give us a lecture. Yeah, yeah, if they want to. I hope we have if enough that to. not yes. all of them have to, you know? So you can have that's the one point. who's like a really good public speaker yeah. and down to do that, and then others who are like, I just want to do my job. I just, I just, want, to, yeah. I just want to do my job. I've worked with several trans nurses, and it's been interesting. Like I said before, patients are the most uncensored humans that there are. <laughs> patients have no filter and definitely will tell us about ourselves, even when it's in a very mm. rude way. So I definitely, shout out to all the trans uh, medical professionals out there.
So another uh, interesting response that I got that I want to throw out there, and maybe we don't even have a response, but I just kind of want to put it out there, uh, was someone talking about being a non-binary senior citizen and how specifically in like senior healthcare, there's not as many accommodations because people sometimes think of you know trans people and especially non-binary people as like, this is a youth thing. It's like a new thing coming out there. And so, uh, yeah, I guess just remembering that like trans people and non-binary people come in all ages and like we need these accommodations again in places beyond just specifically like trans affirming yeah, procedures. Me and Alok had a whole episode about uh, the the people oh. that are upper in age who sex are and elderhood? having yeah. sex. So that's an education thing too is yeah. learning that like these elderly people don't have any difference in the way that they do things. It's just that they're a little bit older doing it. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it's I, modifications. I would really, I mean, my heart would break for someone who is older and feels misunderstood, lonely, isolated, and spent however many years without the words, without the community to talk to about it. And I hope they, I hope this individual, these individuals, this entire group has someone now. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I saw from one person saying, I wish that there were more resources for like 30 plus people just starting to figure things out. Uh, and then I also saw, yeah, one person was like, in these senior spheres, I have never once been asked my pronouns. Like people think, some people say this, some people say that, because this person's non-binary and maybe it's not apparent. And they're like, yeah, in senior spaces, no one's ever asked. And that's just really yeah. sad. I can, I can definitely say that that's, you know, it's, it's much easier to ask younger people because you know that they know where you're coming from. Right. Whereas like when I ask my elderly patients what pronouns they want to come, they be ready to cuss me out. So it definitely is a, again, a learning curve for everyone. So. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so last answer for the ANA. I feel like this kind of goes with the theme of what we've been talking about this whole time. Uh, so this person said, doctors, nurses, surgeons, etc., all need to continually research and learn about trans and intersex people and our bodies, share what you learn with colleagues, attend conferences with actual trans people, staff, front desk, and phone operators all need training, and hire trans educators, which I just thought, you know, okay. pay trans people. I'm always into that. Dun, dun. Hey, <laughs> they checked us, okay? Yeah, this is they get, checked us. Get Jackson I... Bird's CV into healthcare <laughs> systems, like right now. There are definitely other trans people with more medical experience and scientific experience than me. But yeah, no, I think, you know, both of you said at the top of like basically zero information about trans people in, uh, in your education, so. Yeah, I mean, every patient it has their own thing, and mm -hmm. it's, it's our job to learn what, you know, what their situation is, so I absolutely b believe that who else to learn from than someone who actually is trans. Good <laughs> so, point. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, why wouldn't we have a trans educator? Why wouldn't we have, like, someone that can support in that type of way? Why not? Yeah. And these are the individuals who can not only help us with understanding the experience, how to care for these patients, how to communicate, how to listen, and how patients should be able to identify themselves by however they want to and not be labeled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Unless they want labels. Label yeah. Labels can whatever be good want. and can Label. be bad. Label. Yeah, whatever. Don't label them. <laughs> Your world. Well, and on the note of continuing education and spreading around, we made a video all together with some other folks on PBS Vitals channel. So make sure to go check out that video. Subscribe to PBS Vitals. We already plugged another video that you've done. You do so many interesting and cool videos over on PBS Vitals. All kinds of interesting topics about, like, why is there a nurse's shortage? Mm -hmm. And how much should you actually be drinking? That one was a good one for me to watch. <laughs> Your liver wants you to watch that one. <laughs> <laughs> and make sure to follow these two as well on Instagram, Twitter, wherever. Keeping it kinky is Sheena and Alok Patel MD is Alok. Uh, Woo! Yeah, go Thank watch. Thank you for answering, letting us answer your answers. Yes. Thank you for educating us and thank you for just being a part of the bigger plan of making humans better. Oh, I love that. Thanks for giving us something to listen to and learn from. Absolutely. And thank you both for being open to being here and being with us. Thank you to all of you for your questions and answers. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Love and thanks all around. Woo!